So hello everyone and welcome again to the judicial process. Today we are switching gears from the pretrial matters and pretrial proceedings to the actual criminal trial itself. Uh, this lecture will have several parts to it because the criminal trial is a lengthy endeavor. Uh, it's a complicated endeavor. It's much more than you see on TV. And I'll warn you that it's much more boring than you see on TV. Uh, if you've done your courthouse visitation or you, you go to the court, you know what it's like to be a lawyer. Just, just add in hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of research and writing, and then boring for you. Um, I mean, that, that's kind of like a standard, most serious problem that we're really doing. So, that being said, of all the trials, the most fun is the criminal trial. Um, that's going to be the focus of, of, of this lecture and the upcoming lectures. Uh, I've set aside several days for the criminal trials because it is a lengthy process. And we're going to go from beginning, very, very beginning to end. Okay? So what you can presume at this point, jumping in, is you can presume that the defendant has been arraigned. All right, so the defendant has become officially a defendant. There will be a grand jury indictment. On the nation, they've been arraigned, so they've been given their formal charges, and pretrial motions have all been settled. And we'll talk a little bit about motions for the in a second, but for the most part, everything's settled. We are at, we're ready to start the trial process. So, here's the introduction to the criminal trial, right? So this number is actually widely disputed. Um, the highest number is 10%. So of all the cases that are brought in the United States, right? We look at the millions and millions of cases that are brought in the United States per year, only 10% ever go to trial. Now, more accurate estimates place at around 5%, but 10% is kind of the official estimate. Um, and that's usually felonies, right? If we're talking misdemeanors, we are going to get a fine or a probation a slap on the wrist. Almost 100% of those are going to be pretty dark. Right? So really, we, 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 you can have a trial for a misdemeanor, um, but it's very rare. Because misdemeanors are so minor that it's just not that big of a deal. Whereas felonies, they carry a lot heavier consequences. And so if we're going to get the trial, it's going to be a criminal felony. Now, that being said, this number is very small. And that's despite the Constitution system and the guarantee, right, that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. Well, we're going to discuss what that means. What does it mean to have a speedy and public trial? What does it mean to have a trial by a jury? How do we select the jury? Who do we want on our jury? So on and so forth. Now, as I said before, you can presume that basically everything has been handled. All of the arraignments have been handled. The initial appearance has been handled. They've been indicted. They've been charged via a complaint and information. And now we are at the trial stage. Now, some jurisdictions, and I'd say actually most jurisdictions, allow you to choose between, if you're going to trial, a bench trial or a jury trial. And so a jury trial is kind of what you're familiar with. Let's see on TV. Um, you can range from like six to 12 people, depending on your jurisdiction. We'll talk about all that later. But really, the big difference between them is, is you have the jury trial, which you're familiar with, or you have the bench trial. The bench trial is where we don't have a jury. The person who's making the decision as to guilt and innocence is the judge. All right, so that's the difference between a bench trial and a jury trial. Most jurisdictions, you can choose between the two. Constitutionally, however, you are only guaranteed a jury trial. Right, so they don't, if you ask for a bench trial, 
We don't have to give you a bench trial. It's not the Constitution, but we do have to give you a jury trial. Now, there are some reasons that people would choose um, a bench trial or a jury trial. So usually this is going to be in cases where the charges are very in and of themselves prejudicial and aggravating, right? So think about anything that would piss off Nancy Grace. Um, you're probably going to want a bench trial. Uh, if you don't know who Nancy Grace is, you're lucky. Um, I'm trying to the best way to say this. So the bench trial, you're going to want this for things that kind of outrage the community, right? So we have this presumption of innocence. But anytime you look at a newspaper, or when they go to it, or you watch the news, or hear some someone on the radio, some news snippet about somebody who's been charged with something, we all automatically assume that person is guilty. Right? If you ever read the comment section of a news article, holy God, somebody can be charged with something and you have like kill him, hang him, da da and it's like, okay, they're, they're, they're innocent at this point. But we just presume they're guilty. So it enrages us. Some charges enrages, enrages us to the degree that we just could not be fair. Right? So if we have a child sex case, a child molestation case, I'm not going to want to take that to a jury. Right? Yes, I'll have to convince one person to vote not guilty, and I get on jury, and whatever. But I'm not going to want to take that to a jury. Right? Because the judge has seen it all. The judge has seen everything, has seen the worst of the worst, right? So if there are pictures, if there's video, whatever, the judge is not going to be phased by it. The judge is going to apply the law, and if that's for the law, then that's it. A jury, on the other hand, it's funny. Um, in jury trials, it, like for like jury, like child pornography, which is very rare, I mean, it, it's low level, so it's, never, it's a non-violent um, felony, so it, it rarely goes to trial. But even in those cases, you cannot show the jury necessarily the photos or the video that the person was looking at, because that in and of itself would be a crime. Right? So that would be viewing a child pornography. So I mean, there's a lot of editing that has to go to process, and it's just a, this long process. Um, but even with redacting portions um, of child pornography, Jurors are still going to get upset, right? I mean, if you have a little kid who's being molested, for lack of better words, by an adult, that's horrific. That's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, and just seeing those images is going to piss you off, and you're going to want somebody to pay. And there's probable cause, there's more likely than not that this person, this scumbag, did it. Well, that's what my jurors are going to think if I have a client charge with that. I don't want a jury. I want a judge. Right? The judge is probably going to presume the same thing, that they're, they're scumbag. But they're not going to be outraged. They're not going to be shocked. They've seen it all. Right? They've seen the ugliest of humanity. So that's why bench trials can be more fair. We also like bench trials if we have really highly technical matters. So we're talking about the jury we're going to talk about in jury selection. Um, Jurors are basically meat with eyes, right? Um, it's not hard to get out of jury duty at all. Uh, if you get stuck on a jury, like, chances are we selected you because you, we don't think you have critical thinking skills. Uh, it's sad, but it's, it's just kind of what it is. So we have a highly technical matter. So if we're dealing with matters like a patent law, right? Um, where we're talking or engineering or, or something that, that's really, really um, field specific, where we need somebody who actually is intelligent to make a decision, uh, we will probably go for a bench trial over a jury trial. Right? Um, because trying to explain patent law to juries is like trying to explain quantum physics. To a fucking hamster. Um, it's just not going to happen. So we go for bench trial, but again, you're guaranteed the jury trial, you're not guaranteed the bench trial. But most cases, uh, 
this case is a bench trial for more, but in the very rare event that we have a jury trial, we follow a very formal process. And this is true for bench trials as well. So our process, the trial portion, um, once the trial takes off, the trial officially begins, I should say, once we have the jury seated. All right, so we've selected the jury. We'll talk about how we select juries and voir dire and all of that. But once the jury is seated, we go through a very, very strict process. Right? Generally speaking, we go with motions in limine, which are just pre-trial motions that we're raising at the last minute, usually to admit or exclude evidence before trial, before the first witness testifies. Then we'll have, generally speaking, opening statements by the prosecution and by the defense. Then we're going to have the prosecution's case in chief, and then we're going to have the defense's case in chief. Then we're going to have closing arguments by the defense and then by the prosecution, and there will be a rebuttal period. Now, some jurisdictions switch that up and allow the prosecution to go first, then the defense, then the prosecution to have a rebuttal. And that's kind of the more common theme that we see. Um, then we go to verdict. Now, this is a, it, 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 this all occurs along a very strict timeline. Right, so judges do not have time or patience for things that waste time. Uh, they they will hurry up a trial. They will make it move along. Um, because we schedule trials for like three days. Or if it's a really highly publicized case, maybe a month, maybe two months. Some trials have lasted 18 months. Um, judges don't have time for crap, and they won't put up with it because their docket is very full. Now, that being said, there are some deviations from this really kind of strict process. So this really occurs, and we'll get into it a little bit later, but this occurs really at opening statements, and that's for the most part about it. Um, so opening statements usually, again, that's what's going to begin the, the, the process of the jury seated, do the motions to eliminate, sometimes without the jury there, sometimes with the jury there, but the jury seated. I get up, I start to make my opening statement. I'm prosecution, I go first. If I'm a defendant, I have an option. I can either give my opening statement right after the prosecution, or I can defer, like just like you do in football, I can defer and do my opening statement after the prosecution's case in chief. So, right, so before I put on my evidence and I call my witnesses, I'll give my opening statement. So that's the really kind of one deviation and it doesn't happen that often. Usually we follow the, this pattern, motions of a opening statements, prosecution case in chief, defendant case in chief, closing arguments, discussion, deliberation, verdict. Now, that being said, as I mentioned earlier, don't believe the media. Trials, even criminal trials, are pretty boring. I mean, they, they have some fun, interesting parts. Like, don't get me wrong. But like the fun stuff really kind of occurs before the trial. Uh, that's where you have motions to suppress and maybe the arguments back and forth. But the trial itself is kind of dull. That's why even if you watch publicized cases, so if you watch the Casey Anthony trial, or you watch uh, the OJ Simpson trial, not every single minute of that was televised. Because there are some parts where you're just like, who the hell cares? Like you at home, which does this well, this doesn't matter. But we're trying to prove some kind of legal point. So it's really a, a can be a very dull process. But it's an important one. And I say it's important because consider the ramifications of this very dull process. You are literally taking could be taking somebody's life forever. You could be killing them, or you could be taking years of their life ruining their job, ruining their career, ruining their family, taking away their home, doing all of this. Like, it is a big freaking deal. It's one that doesn't get necessarily that much respect, 
Uh, we think that our criminal justice system, and I'm the first to say, is completely broken, and it absolutely is. But I'll say this, it's not necessarily the fault of the lawyers. It's largely the fault of the general public. Um, but it, it is very, very, very important to, to remember the consequences that this process brings. And you might be a little outraged when I talk about the budget here. Um, by what I say and how I say it, but I'm just going to tell you the truth. But keep in mind that somebody's life is at stake. So before we get to all the fun jazz, well, here we have to first look through the law. So you might have heard me in reference that cases sometimes take a year, six months to a year, maybe two years, depending on the jurisdiction, to get to trial. That's absolutely true. And this also used to be the case. It actually used to be a little bit shorter than that. But basically, in the 1970s, Congress got fed up with this was at the beginning of the Get Tough movement. I got fed up with defendants having two years on the streets, or and defendants got upset with having two years sitting in jail, waiting for their trial so they could go to prison. Right? Like it was just like both sides were equally upset for three different reasons. Um, so Congress says, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pass the Speedy Trial Act. The Speedy Trial Act is exactly what it sounds like. They give you a speedy friggin' trial. Right now, this was the U.S. Congress, so this only applied at the federal level, but most states enacted some kind of form of this. So what we're going to see, basically, the way the act was envisioned, is you would have approximately 100 days between the moment that you were brought before the your, your arrest, when you were brought before the judge for your initial appearance, and your trial began. You had 100 days. Right? And the way it was initially envisioned was after 100 days, we dismissed the case. Because the prosecution is holding somebody after 100 days, I mean, that's a long time in and of itself, let alone two years. Like, you dismiss the case, but you bring the charges once you have the evidence. Don't just sit there and, like, dilly dally around. That's what they thought would happen, but what really happens is, is no. Sorry. It, 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 it was a nice sentiment, and I appreciate Congress doing it, but it turns out it didn't really do a whole hell of a lot. Um, so if we think about it this way, so the information for the indictment has to be filed with the third day requirement and the third requirement. So the information or indictment has to be filed within 30 days from the date that the person was arrested or served the summons. Okay? So assuming that we have that 30 days in there, that counts towards the trial process. Then the trial must commence, so it doesn't have to end, but it has to start within 70 days from the date that the information or the indictment was filed. Right? So you have 70 days from that point. Or, here's the or, from the date which the defendant appears before an officer of the court in which the charge is pending, whichever is later. So this would be the initial appearance, right? Or it could be the arraignment, depending on if it's an information or a complaint or a grand jury indictment. So remember, you have 48 hours to bring somebody before a judge when you arrest them. That judge, when you bring that person before that judge, if it's a federal level, it starts the clock on the speedy trial act. Right? So you have 48 hours of like not anything counting. And as soon as you bring that person before that judge, that prosecution has 70 days to start the trial. Now, we recognize that prosecutors generally have an advantage, right? They have the police department. Police department investigates the crimes for them. Police department gets the evidence. The police department, I mean, the police has, I mean, they're, they almost do the bidding, even though they're separate of the prosecution. Well, the defense has to be able to investigate the case as well. They have to be able to come up with a theory of the case. And so what Congressman and, and, and the Congress persons were, were, were concerned about 
was that if we said, okay, you have to have a very quick trial, that the prosecution would walk into the arraignment and say, we're ready for trial, let's have a trial right now, and we'd have a trial. And the defendant would get ready for it. Right? Like they, they wouldn't have an opportunity to investigate, they wouldn't have an opportunity to do that. So we included a provision that basically said, it cannot start less than 30 days from the date that the defendant first appeared in court. Right? So you have 30 days out, and then basically you have a 40 day window. Right? So that's those 30 days count towards the 70. So you have 30 days where you cannot have a trial unless the defendant agrees in writing to have a trial before that. So really, you have 40 days. 40 days to have a trial. Um, it's hard to schedule something in 40 days, especially considering that we're talking millions of cases of trial a year. Right? So it kind of was set up for failure, but it did send a strong signal to judges and support that, like, all right, just start expediting this. Um, unfortunately, we just haven't, even though crime has gone down consistently, arrests and prisoner populations have grown exponentially. Doesn't make any sense. Now, what this slide is getting at is tolling, totally, the concept of tolling. Totally. So the Speedy Trial Act included in its 100 days a number of what's called tolling provisions. So tolling is basically we hit pause on the clock. Oh, we have 100 days and we hit pause on the clock. So every day from whatever action we talk about occurs until that action is decided or ends does not count. Once that action is decided or ends, then we, re, then we start the clock. We don't restart it, but we start it from where it was. So when we talk, so basically it's just like hitting pause, right? So for instance, here's some of, some of the tolling provisions. Uh, one is a competency determination, right? Um, has been ordered, the defendant is on trial for different charges. Um, so if we're trying to decide whether or not this defendant is able to assist in their own defense. So we take it to psychiatrists. We have a prosecution psychiatrist. We want a defense psychiatrist. And we'll probably have a third party court appointed psychiatrist examine the defendant and decide whether or not they're competent. Well, that takes a lot of time. But I mean, it takes people coordinating with the doctor and getting all that. So the judge says, I am ordering a competency determination and the court orders it, that gets paused. Every day that we're waiting for the competency determination to come down does not count. But as soon as the judge says you are competent or you are not competent, that clock begins again. Right? Not new, it just starts from where it was. So let's say you're 20 days from arrest and brought 20 to uh, the judicial officer, they don't get bailed, they're sitting in jail. 20 days goes by. Judge says, okay, competency determination. I, this, this, this guy is uh, kind of questionable. Right? Like I, I want to make sure this person is competent to assist in their own defense. That causes it. All right, so we're 20 days out, that causes it. So if it takes us 100 days to coordinate the experts and get a agreement or at least submit reports to the judge, and the judge makes a decision when they can based on their docket and their caseload. So let's say that takes 100 days. As soon as the judge makes the decision of competent or incompetent, next day we start day 21. Right? So we don't start day 121, we start day 21. So it pauses that time frame. All right, so again, this is also true is if the defendant is on trial for different charges. Um, what this means is quite literally the defendant has two trials going on. We're going to pause the second trial until the first trial is over. And again, the idea is we want to have the defendant be able to assist in the defense, and that's a lot hanging over somebody's head. 
yada yada yada, there's double jeopardy that could come into play, there's all kinds of things that could come into play. Plus, if this guy gets a life sentence on their charge, why would we have another trial and add on years to a life sentence? They're not getting out. There's no point in having a trial. Right, so we pause. The emergency delay is resulting from what's called an interlocutory appeal. So what we're going to see is, generally speaking, you cannot appeal anything in a case until the case is decided. There are a few exceptions. So let's say you have a motion to suppress a gun, right? And it is clear that that gun should not have come into evidence. But the judge allows it in. You cannot appeal that judge's decision until your client is found guilty. Then you can appeal the judge's decision on the motion to suppress. And the thought process behind this kind of prohibition on appeals is every time a judge makes a ruling, one of the parties would appeal the ruling. But one of them would say, no, I appeal it is stop process. The trials would take three years, it would take 30 years. Because every single ruling will get appealed and have to go to the court. And so what we say is, let's just wait and find out what happens. All right? So yeah, maybe the judge allowed the gun to come into evidence and it shouldn't have, but the defendant gets found not guilty. Who the hell cares? Right? Like, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't matter. But if the defendant's found guilty, okay, sure, you can appeal that and everything else that you want to appeal from one appeal. Now, there are certain issues that stop the trial dead in its tracks. And probably one of the most important ones is going to be double jeopardy. So if the defendant claims that they have already been tried for these charges in this jurisdiction, that stops the clock. Because what we're going to do is we're going to investigate, and the court's going to have hearings, and we are going to figure out whether or not we are putting somebody at double jeopardy, whether we're violating their constitutional rights. That will be subject to an involuntary appeal. So, mid trial, even if it happens mid trial, the defense is like, oh yeah, I already, I already got tried for this. Or like nine days into trial, it pauses that part of trial. Like, you can raise it at any time, you don't wait it. You can start it at any time. Okay. Um, so we can pause when, again, it's an immediate pause. It's like we don't even issue another sentence, that pause. So you say the word double jeopardy, you'll look that thing, it just shuts it down. Um, you can appeal bail. Bail is not usually interlocutory, but it can be. Um, another interlocutory appeal, I think the most common one. Um, Competency, that was a big one. Um, that's, a, that's a really big one, actually. Uh, so if you make a competency determination, you're the judge and you say, this person is competent to stand trial. And you as the defendants go, <laughs> no, they're not. You can file an interlocutory appeal. Basically saying, we're pausing the trial, we're pausing the investigation of all that jazz until the appellate court or the highest court rules whether or not this person is competent to stand trial. Because if this person is not competent, if they are not mentally clear to stand trial, they cannot assist in their own defense. We're violating their constitutional rights. We cannot try someone unless they are competent. Now we can hold them and treat them in a prison hospital, which we do, until they become competent and then try them and then throw them in prison. But it pauses that clock. All right, so those interlocutory appeals. Um, if a delay results from any pretrial motion, and this is usually filed by the defense, right? Prosecution, sometimes a motion counts, sometimes they don't. But if the defense files a pretrial motion, any time between that motion being filed in court, it gets a stamp on it, it gets a date and time on it, any time between that date and time that it is filed and the date and time that it is decided is told. You pause the speedy trial. So this 
So if I do a motion to this, if I do a motion to suppress evidence, guess what happens? The trial gets postponed. The, the, the clock is stopped until the judge rules on the suppression motion because I'm the defense and I'm the one making it. Right? And think about the, the, the policy behind this. If we allow defendants to just raise motion after motion, they can hit that 100 day limit really quickly. Right? I file a couple of motions and then, oh, oh shit, I still have two more days and file another motion. And then be like, oh, sorry, you meant it's 100 days. And you have to dismiss the case. Sorry. But, like, that's, we know that's what defendants would do, right? And that's what the defense attorneys would do. That's the logical thing to do. So, we told um, any delay resulting from proceedings related to transfer of a case or the removal of the defendant from another district. So, this is this person appears in front of some judge in Eastern New York, or Western New York, and we want to extradite them back to Western New York. All that time that we spend to extradite, even though they've already seen a judge, right? Because they have to see a judge to be deemed a fugitive from justice. They've already seen a judge. All that time it takes to extradite them back does not count towards the speed trial. Wow, let's see. Any delay resulting from consideration by the court of a proposed plea bargain. So again, the last lecture we talked about plea bargain. If we have a plea bargain and we submit it to the court, we say, court, we've agreed that if John Doe pleads guilty, we'll dismiss charges, he's charged with A, B, and C. We'll dismiss A and C and agree to a sentence of two years in prison suspended and five years of probation. And I submit that to the judge because it's, it's one that's a binding decision on the judge. The judge can say yes, or the judge can say no. And keep in mind, the judge says no to the plea, then the defendant can withdraw the guilty plea. If you're not guilty plea, we go to trial. All right, but any time that we said we submit something to the judge, it stops the clock. All right. So we can't say, oh, we had a plea, oh, it's 101 days, he did decide, so yeah, I guess I go home. Not how that works. Um, and then if the defense asks for a continuance, or the defense agrees to a continuance, uh, so what happens a lot of times is we'll have a trial date set within 100 days, but we're like, <laughs> um, my schedule doesn't work that day, or I need a lot more time because this is a real complicated case. And we can't have a triple homicide case in 100 days. Like, it's just impossible to investigate. So the prosecution may file for what's called a motion for continuance. That just basically means let's push him state off a little bit further, a couple months down the road. Right? And the defense will usually agree, especially if the charges are severe. Or the defense can say, let's push this trial off further down the road. And the prosecution will usually agree because they don't care. If it's contested, so if it's not contested, I should say, if it's not contested, if the defense agrees to it or the defense files it, the Speedy Trial Act clock is paused. If it is contested, if the defense says, no, we want to go to trial as planned, but the judge grants the continuance, that clock does not stop. All right, so it only stops if the defendant is involved and agrees or makes that or it makes the motion. If they fight it, but the judge grants it, the fact that you fought it, but you didn't want it, so it's not your will, the clock keeps ticking. That can screw over prosecutors. And you have to be very strategic um, when you're a prosecutor in when you ask for continuance and when you just dismiss the charges. So we had one while I was working for the U.S. Coast Guard. So in the Coast Guard, uh, I was a civilian. I was like, look at me. I was not in the military. Um, but what happened in the JAG office was in if the defendant was a member of the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard would serve as the prosecution, and the U.S. Navy would serve as the defense counsel. Right. So I remember one day I was in my office and this 
I'm just like two days into it, like working with them. I was in my office, so like setting crap up, and this motion gets put on my desk. It was a motion to dismiss the case as for a violation of the Speedy Trial Act. It took four attorneys and myself in one of those giant desk calendars. We had to go buy one of those giant desk calendars. And we literally sat there and counted days. They're like, oh, did this day count? I don't know. Like we would debate whether a day counted or not. It took us a solid six hours to figure out, like, oh shit. Yeah, that's our bad. Like it's been 101 days. And it was, it was 101 days. So we had to dismiss the case. Um, yeah, it's literally you take your calendar and you count days. That's how serious we are when we're talking about the speed trial act. Now, if the act is violated, right, the defendant may, like it did in this example I just gave you, they may move to dismiss the case, right? Say, nope, it's been 100 days, sorry. Now, here's the really important part the case can be dismissed with or without prejudice. Now, prejudice doesn't mean what's in the law, what it means in how we do What prejudice means in the law is basically if we dismiss a case with prejudice, it means the judge says, I am throwing this case out and you cannot bring these charges again. So you don't get a second bite of that apple. If I dismiss a case without prejudice, I say, okay. Case is dismissed, but you can bring those charges again if you want, and then you have another 100 days, right? And what's going to happen is the more you piss off the judge and the more the prosecution has delayed, you're at your feet, the more the prosecution has done stuff that, that's even kind of questionable, the more likely the judge is going to throw it out with prejudice and say, you want to know, you had your chance, you drug it out, you took the statue of the mud, do not get another shot. Right, so it's not really a double jeopardy type situation, but it has the same essential impact. Right? You can't bring the same charges in that jurisdiction. You can't. Now, now that you know our time frame, let's start with right before the trial begins. Let's say you elect a jury trial because uh, there's so much fun. Um, yeah, so, 1960s, a lot of things changed in the American judicial system. And we had the Warren Court, which was a very uh, liberal court, but that's where we get Miranda rights, that's where we get basically half or most of our, our common rights today, right, is, is in the 1960s. At this time, we also had Congress that actually kind of worked together to come up with solutions. What a crazy freaking thought, working together. So they came up with the Federal Jury Selection and Service Act of 1968. And what it basically provides is exactly what the Constitution says. It says that at each stage of the jury selection process, and there are stages, the jurors must represent a, quote, fair and unbiased cross-section of the community. Okay. A fair and unbiased cross section of the community. So, what this would mean in theory is let's say we have we have three three races in this community. We have white, black, Southeast Asian. Whites account for 70%, blacks account for 20%, Southeast Asians account for 10% of the population. Well, our jury pool should look like 70% should probably be white, 20% should probably be black, and 10% should probably be Southeast Asian, right? That's a cross section. The idea is like our jury would resemble the community. That was the thought process, that was the hope behind this legislation. In reality, that's not the case. Like, in reality, if you are a minority defendant, they are throwing every minority off that jury. Uh, it's, and we're going to get into that, the Batson test, and all that in a little bit. So, they did, Congress did articulate at least four reasons for how 
find this fair and biased cross section of the community. Right? It seems like something that people are like, yeah, that's duh. Like, yeah, but it's only there. But Bob Richardson had to justify it. They justified it to the American people in four ways. The first way they said was decision making. Right? So they believed that the jury should represent the common sense judgment of a cross section of the community. And again, what this does is it serves to protect the defendant from a overzealous prosecutor and a biased judge. Right? Because if we have, let's say we have a racist prosecutor, we have a racist judge, if we have a fair cross section of the community, yeah, we might have racists to do on that jury, but we're gonna have people that are abhorrently like they they just abhorrently opposed to racism. That would be a fair cross section of the community, right? And, and they would be involved in the process and they could stop and, and dissent or whatever they needed to do. So it serves as a check. The second, we want the impartial jury. So oh, this is the fun one because this is the one that's not true. Um, the idea here is that the government was going to prevent hacking of the jury, right? So. The idea was that the government could not just get pro-prosecution witnesses or pro-prosecution jurors and that's it, right? Throw anybody who might have reasonable doubt or might look for the defendant out of the jury. But that was the thought process. That backfired because that's exactly what both sides do is we get we don't care if you can think critically. We don't want you to think critically. We just want you to vote for our side. And like there are, oof, you want to make money going to jury demographics and statistics. Holy God. Um, jury consultants make a ridiculous amount of money. And they sit there and they, they tell the defense attorney or the prosecuting attorney or the uh, plaintiff's attorney which jurors to choose based upon demographics. So like, well, this person is a 26 year old African American male with an associate's degree who lives at home with his parents. And based upon these demographics, statistics tell us this person is going to lean very pro defense, which is actually true. Um, that's how involved we get. And we do mess with it. We pay people, if it's a high stakes trial, both sides are going to pay investigators to investigate the jurors. Right? And not to hold anything over their head and not to um, threaten them or anything like that, but to get a sense of, okay, this is how they voted. So this is probably how they think, and this is how they think, and this is probably what they're going to think about this piece of evidence. So this is what we're going to think about this piece of evidence. And you just make, you go through this whole process, and you're trying to decide and make decisions about what you're going to do, what you're going to say based upon what these people who investigated each juror is going to say. Yeah, that's why I say if it's a high stakes case, like, whew, you're a juror, everything's going to come out about you. Um, so the impartial jury thing doesn't really work because both sides now want a partial jury. Just different ways. So I guess you could call it partial. Then we have unfairness. And this is the idea that this was when the United States um, was a becoming, was it's never been the greatest country in the world, but it was, it was becoming a very good country. Uh, we were saying rights to people, right? we were trying to end systemic racism. And one of our goals behind this act was to prevent the appearance of unfairness. Right? We didn't want other countries to look at our system and go, oh, democracy is so great. Well, then why is their trial system so messed up? Why isn't it fair? Because it hadn't been fair until that point. We're going to see that there's tests that evolved in how we select jurors that came about because prosecution, if they had a black defendant, would use their challenges, some of the different types of challenges, to throw every black person off that jury. And we're saying 1960s, again, 1960s was a very turbulent time in the United States. I mean, it was, social change was just insane. Like, you think today it's bad, like then, holy God. Um, but this, you know, the, through pain is where you make progress. 
Um, and so that's kind of what we did, is we tried to prevent some fairness. There was perception of unfairness. And the fourth, again, related to this time frame is civil rights. Right? So it, the idea here is, again, historically, minority groups or underrepresented groups, so this includes uh, women, American, Latina, uh, Latina, you name it. Right? it. It includes all these groups that basically aren't white now. Then underrepresented in the democratic process. They should not be underrepresented in the democratic process. We want them to, to, to actively participate. We're no longer going to discriminate. And that includes juries. Right? So you actually, it's weird to say, you have a right to serve on a jury. You're a felon, you go to convicted of a felony, you lose the right to serve on a jury, but you have that right. right? We consider it part of the democratic process is jury service. Now in New York State, you can actually go online and volunteer for jury duty. So like if you ever have an exam that you kind of want to get out of or postpone, go volunteer for jury duty because under the law, we have to wait until your jury duty is over to give you the exam. So just kind of keep that in your back pocket in case you take, like, you're in physics, you go, fuck, why did I take physics? Just keep that in your back pocket. Um, so that's kind of our big, like, forward reasons for this, this requirement. So what actually happens, right? So we're governed by this statute. We're promoting this fair cross section, unbiased cross section of the community, which again, it's a joke because it's not true. Um, but this process begins, and it's supposed to start at every stage, right? It has three stages. The unbiased cross section of the community has to be present in each stage. It has to be present at the compiling of the master list. It has to be present at the summoning of the jury of the year. And it has to be present when conducting voir dire when selecting the petted jury. So a couple things, there's a couple things we're going to reference the master list. We'll talk about here, uh, and you'll understand what it is. Uh, the jury of the year is basically the group, the group that we're going to select the jury from. Right? So we call like 60 people, we're going to select 12 people from them to serve on the jury. Right? The 60 people, that's what the jury. The jury itself, the actual jurors, the real name for a jury is a is called a pettit jury. Right? And the idea is it, it distinguishes if I say jury, am I talking grand jury? Am I talking the trial jury? If I'm talking trial jury, the proper term is pettit jury. Just what did its name? Um, so again, the statute says it has to be fair at all stages. So this begins with compiling of the master list. So the master list is basically the list of everyone in the jurisdiction who is over the age of 18 and has at least some engagement with the government, even how minor it is. Um, it's basically everyone over the age of 18 who's not a felon. That's the master list right, in the jurisdiction. So that's why, like, when you move to a place, you have to tell them if you're moving there, you get put on the master list. That's why you tell the license, that's why you have to you know, get your driver's license changed or have a little sticker thrown on the back if you change your address. Like, it's not because anybody really cares, it's because we want to know because we're going to use that for basically the jury. Um, so, most jurisdictions to get this list of like, Who's in the population who's over 18 and, 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 and is not a felon? We're going to use voter registration. So if you register to vote, you are now put on the list for jury service. So if you've ever registered to vote or you have ever voted, you are on a list for jury service. Now, you as college students get to get out of jury service if you want to. You can say, I'm not going to do this. Because I'm presently enrolled in college. And then you are excused. Like you, don't even, you don't even have to go. You can just mark a little piece of paper and send it to them. Um, but 
the idea is it's giving us this, this place, right? Now, there's a big problem with this. Um, and the problem has historically been minorities are significantly underrepresented in elections. Right? Minorities tend not to vote, more so than white people. Like, specifically, like, white old people. Like, white old people, they do, two, they do three things. White old people vote, white old, play, old people play bingo, and white old people die. Like, that is literally all you have to look forward to when you age. So that's why, like, that's why, that is why our commercials are so, some of those commercials are so like, targeted and scary. It's to scare the shit out of grandma. Because grandma's going to go vote. My lazy ass, like, people my age are like, eh, going to vote. And eh, eh, that's kind of a pain. Not going to. And that's why messaging gets so scary. That's why the stakes always seem so high. Right, both sides make it seem like it's the end of the world if you vote for the other side. They're trying to scare old white people. That's it. Because they're like, there's the ones they're gonna vote. So the more we scare the shit out of grandma, the more she's gonna vote our way. Like that is sadly how the American voting system works in a nutshell. I don't talk about Trump when I said that, because like he's all about the democratic process, but he really does help. Um that being said. Because we do not have, we've done this to ourselves, right? We've erected barriers to minorities, um, and front minorities keep them from voting. And so think about when 14th Amendment was passed and theoretically uh, former slaves could vote. What did we do? We created poll tests, right? And then we have questions like, how many bubbles can we get from far and so? Right? And so and the idea is, no matter what answer you give, you'd be wrong, but they only gave it to black people. The people in white didn't have to take the ball back. Like, we erected barriers. Right? And we dissuaded minority turnout. One thing that's happening, and, and not to go into a partisan lecture, but in trying to keep this as nonpartisan as possible, is look what's happening in Georgia. Right? So Georgia had a really high minority turnout. Atlanta, right? Huge minority turnout. Minorities overwhelmingly vote. Today, most minorities vote Democrat or Democratic. Uh, historically, uh, blacks in the South specifically would vote Republican. And the rationale that a lot of them gave was like, you know, well, what policies do you believe that that you know align with your idea? A lot of them said was well, the party of Lincoln. Lincoln freed the slaves, which is absolutely true, right? Lincoln was a Democrat, was a Republican. You're like, okay, yeah, that's fair enough. And in the South, the Democrats, we called them Dixiecrats. Because the Northern Democrats were about like let's end slavery, let's extend rights, let's you know integrate. The South was like hell the fuck no. And who controlled the South at the time? The South, if we look back at the picture, it was blue. It was technically Democrats. What ultimately happens is like basically the Democrats and the Republicans in the South just kind of trade names. It's just a weird process. There's a whole like there's a whole series about this process. It's this weird process where they just have trade identities. And so it turns it red. But it's still the same public people. It is what it is. But there would be a lot of times voting against their own interests because it was the party of Lincoln. Right? Now we've moved away from that as older generations who either are work descendants of slaves or you know, immediate descendants or third of slaves, something like that, where they have that tie to the land again, as they die off, which is, it sounds fucking terrible, but as they, as they die off, and as the younger generations who didn't necessarily have or have to go through the horrors of slavery, the horrors of Jim Crow, 
having the military there to protect you so you can go to school, you know, with immigration, things like that. People who don't have that, those are the generations that we're seeing coming up. And we're seeing them vote, they're coming out vote, and we're voting overwhelmingly democratic. So we also know that Democrats, young people, and minorities tend to vote at the much greater rates in early voting than grandma, old white people. Old white people still want to go to the polls and mark up on the back, right? America. Like, that's what they want to do. And you're like, okay, that's cute, it's fine, whatever. But, like, we have the internet now. Can we just hurry this shit up? Like, can I just, I, I can text to vote for American Idol. Why the fuck can't I text to vote for president? Like, I'm just throwing it out there. Like, if you're good enough for Ryan Seacrest, fucking good enough for me. Um, but that's not going to matter. Go there. But what George is doing, Georgia is specifically because Georgia has historically been red. Georgia got put blue in the presidential election, and then the two senatorial runoffs both went Democratic. Why? Because of early voting minorities. And so Georgia is now restricting early voting. Um, because the state assembly is still Republican. The Democrats, they lost a lot of free seats. Uh, they thought that it was going to be like a blue, what they call a blue wave. It was like, you know, like you got the national level, yeah, you got some blue seats, but at state level level, blue seats turned red. Right? So people split their ticket, which is becoming more common, which used to be really rare. So I think it's where we're still evolving, but we still know that the only reason really that, that, that Georgia flipped was because of Stacey Abrams getting out the black vote. Which I hadn't been for her to get people to actually go to the polls. Georgia might probably wouldn't have flipped. All right, so minorities are still underrepresented in voting and voter registration. White old people will register to vote and they'll do it all day long. That's their favorite thing besides fucking jello time at the nursing home and the bed. And not my little bed, I guess. Um, that being said, It also again reflect, doesn't reflect poor people. Poor people don't tend to vote because I, even though by law we have to give you time as employers to take off to vote, we don't pay unless you're in New York State. In New York State, your employer has to pay you while you are voting, no matter how long it takes. So if you're waiting three hours around the block, you're getting paid. Right, but historically, it's like you can take off constitutionally, you can, you can take off, but you're not getting paid. Well, if you're poor and, you, and you've got like three kids to feed, you gotta take off the vote? No. No, right? And this is really happened before early voting or mail in voting was a thing. Um, so we have problems there. We also see that people with low intelligence tend not to vote, which is kind of a mixed bag, right? I mean, you're like, kind of a good thing, but at the same time, you want everyone to participate in the democratic process. And like, if we can get the dumb people just not to vote, that'd be super great, but the dumb people have a thing. So they tend not to vote. That's a lower intelligence. What this really, what this really is actually equates to, and it's not dumb people, is, is literacy. Right? We have a horrible literacy rate in the United States. We're like 35th in the world in literacy. Like, a good 20% of our population can't read or write. That should be upset. Well, that part of the population doesn't vote because they can't read the ballot. So they put symbols on the ballot. That's why we have the Democrat donkey and we have the Republican elephant. They put symbols on the ballot. Now I'm like, oh, I see a D or I see a donkey, I, and I want to vote for the donkey or I want to vote for the elephant. Like we've tried ways to get people who are literate to vote. So because of this, we've gone to alternative methods to select um, for selecting from the master list. So that's class. We'll begin here. We'll start talking about states that use driver's licenses, utilities, voter registries, tax returns, 
and people that we start to exempt and read the hell out. 